Bill Manning, uh, welcome back to Australian Musician Magazine. Thank you, Greg, and what a pleasure to be here. Uh, we're talking to you about many things, actually, but uh, one of the main things is your new solo album, Out of the Shed, or, sorry, Out of My Shed. Um, I guess this was a, a lockdown project? Yes, definitely. Um, I, I'd started, started writing some of the material previously, um, uh, but you know, I, I, I real, I'm a real pro procrastinator at times. And uh, as soon as a, the lockdown happened, it was suddenly like, Frankie, what do I do? <laughs> right, finally, I've got to do the album. So, so I got into it and and uh, went and started doing it. So, uh, and and as well as that, I got into painting again because I went to art school when I was young, and. Um, so the lockdown was horrible, but uh, you know, I, I'm one of many people I know that have turned it round and made some use of it. You know. Yeah. So did you find that the songs came easy because you had more time? Um, were you able to spend more time tweaking them than what you normally would? Uh, no, I probably, I probably went up on bum a bit having that much time. You know, like. And yeah, you because know, quite often you sort of shove something down when you're in a bit of a hurry. You shove something down and go, oh, it's not very good, but it'll do for the moment. I'll come back later on and have a listen to it. And then you'll go back sort of, you know, a month later or listen to something and go, actually, it's not half bad. Um, so I, there was a lot of that that happened where I, I had all this time. So I'd sort of do it and then I'd do it again and then I'd do it again and then I'd do it again. And in the end, I'd have to stop doing it because I was getting absolutely nowhere and then leave it for a time, come back and do it. Um, so there's a lot of time spent on the things. Most of the time was actually spent on drums because I'm not a drummer. Yeah. Uh, and rather than program it uh, and do, do all that, because I, I really I can't stand program drums. Uh, I've, always, I've always preferred that human thing where there's a little bit of movement you know, sometimes it surges, sometimes it pulls back. Um, so I had to play the drums myself, which that took a lot of time to to get to try and get it. You know, as I'm not a drummer, but uh, most of it most of it came together fairly quickly. Uh, but then, as well as that, I was painting a lot, so um, it wasn't like I got in the studio and bang, 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 and did the album. I got in the studio and work hard for a couple of weeks or a week or something and had a break then went back to it, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, there's a variety of styles on the album. There's uh, Chicago-style blues, Delta blues, ballads, some finger-picking on the final track. Was that variety intentional? Well, I can't bloody well help it. It drives me nuts. Um, it, as far as commerciality is concerned, uh, the the general public, not so much the general public, but the the sort of um, the working side of of the music industry, you know, the 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 radio people, uh, the press media people, you know, record companies, all that sort of thing. They like things to be categorized very easily, so that you can say. Right, here's a great new jazz record, or here's a great new blues record, or here's a hard rock album, you know, here's a folk album. Uh, and it makes marketing really easy, and it, and, and it means you can focus things. That's just the way I am. I grew up listening to the Beatles and the Stones and, and really liking clever pop music, but I got this love for blues, and so right throughout my life, I've I've had this sort of thing, and and I love folk music too. So I've 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 had this chop change, chop change thing. <laughs> so no one's ever really been able to pigeonhole me, except that I'm a guitar player. You know, you can sort of say, yeah, he's a guitar player, but um, because I, it's it's actually been a drawback in some ways that, that I haven't been more focused. Uh, but 
the trouble is if I if I was to and I could I could focus myself I could say all right I'm only going to do songs that fit in a blues category exactly you know uh, or but then I'd have all these songs sitting around that um, were in different styles and they wouldn't get used so it's just it's just what I do I've I guess I've accepted it after all these years that. You know, I can't help it. I, I I like that sort of thing, and, and like really, when 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 you look at when you look at sort of the artists that I that I grew up with and I like, um, you know, you start looking at people like Eric Clapton, Bob Dylan, the, those sort of artists at the top of their field that I grew up listening to. Um, none of them are really formulated in styles. They actually have great variety across their recordings, so I don't I don't feel bad doing it, you know. But if someone sort of expects that they're just going to get a blues album, they they might go, oh, that's a bit disappointing. Um, the track "Small Town," the second track, uh, has a rockabilly vibe to it. Who were your rockabilly influences? Um, well, I, look, I guess. My sister, actually, my older sister, was played piano in a skiffle group before the Beatles even came along, and they they used to do uh, uh, like Elvis Presley stuff. In fact, they had a rhythm. This really amuses me. They had a rhythm guitarist that couldn't really play, but he was a great singer. So he basically had his strings tuned down, so they just flapped, and he just flapped them. And played so basically played rhythm on them, and they just went flap flap flap. And when you think about it, that sort of helps create a rockabilly sound, anyway. You know. So, what, what guitars mainly did you use on the album? Um, have you acquired any new guitars since the last time we spoke to you? Oh yeah, because because we spoke quite a long time ago, and um, uh, I'm still. Uh, I still play Fender Electrics, and and I've got uh, uh, a couple of Fender Acoustics that I, I, I've had. But um, in the last couple of years, uh, I've had I've had problems with my left hand with arthritis, and I've lost some of the stretch. And I discovered that Cole Clark Guitars make this one called uh, a Little Lady or an LL model. And uh, instead of being a 25 and a half inch scale length, uh, that 23 and a half inch scale length. And that amount of difference that ha has really helped me with my hands. Plus, I love the bloody things. They're just great. And uh, I've got three of them now. I have uh, one of them tuned for slide, one of them normal. And that one I, I was just fiddling around with theirs tuned to tone down. For different, and they're just just really great, you know, and as I said, they've built my hand. And that's another thing I did during lockdown. Uh, I built myself a Telecaster from, from the ground up. Okay. had pieces of pine. Or, I, I made it all out of pine, like the very original ones were. And uh, I, had, I had bits of pine lying around the house. And uh, so I joined them all together in layers and... I did it mainly by hand too. I've got a, I've got an electric jigsaw and I've got a drill, but the rest of it I had to use a hammer and chisel and uh, handsaw and plane and all that and sandpaper. It was great fun. But what happened was that Cole Clark Guitars gave me a fingerboard off a little lady, so I made this Telecaster that's actually a short scale. Uh, with big fat neck, and it's it's absolutely wonderful. It's, it's actually better than any any of my other electrics, if I may say so myself. Um, you did the uh, cover art for for the album uh, out of my shed, um, and as you said, you you studied art uh, in Tasmania in the early days. I, I believe you have an exhibition. I wouldn't say I studied it. I wouldn't say I studied it. I went to art school. I only lasted there about half a year, maybe six, seven months, maybe eight months. And uh, and then Tony Worsley came to town. This is because I went to the Hobart Art College and uh, Tony came to town 
and he he just lost his guitar player Vince Maloney, who went off to join the Bee Gees, and I fronted him in uh, backstage at the uh, uh, Hobart Town Hall and said I'd like to apply for the job. Two days later, I was in Melbourne, so that was the end of my art school. Yeah, but um, you you've been doing a lot of painting and and you're preparing for an exhibition. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I, I, I've got. I'm doing one uh, very locally, like really literally around the corner. There's a lovely little um, uh, design store with an with a cafe attached, and they have a small gallery out the back. Uh, so that one's going to be probably about April. We've decided now, late April or something. Um, and then at the end of July, I'm doing one over at. Mario's famous uh, f famous coffee shop cafe over in Fitzroy, and um, so you know that that's that's a real really great little place to do. They've been having exhibitions there for thirty eight years or something. Yeah. Um, another thing uh, that's happened for you is the uh, Arca Desk Tape album of the Phil Manning Band from. 1975, where the, the proceeds go to the uh, Australian Road Crew Association. Um, what do you remember about those days, 75? Not much. <laughs> no, actually, um, yeah, it, was, it was a great little band, actually. we, we uh, I don't know how long we would have gone for, maybe a year or something like that. You know, the lineup changes all the time happened. Um, but um, there was uh, 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 Trevor Courtney on drums. Trevor had come across from New Zealand, and uh, he played with bands like Stylus and uh, uh, Campact. I think he played with those. But uh, great drummer, and uh, uh, Paul Wheeler from the Sunbury Astics uh, was, was the bass player. So we were a trio. And um, we did quite a bit of touring. We toured right around Australia supporting Canned Heat um, and uh, other show. I think we, I think that lineup supported BB King at the Dallas Brooks Hall. Anyway, we did did a lot of gigs all around the country. Uh, did a, a little special for the ABC in Hobart, which was an educational thing. Uh, to show it for to play in schools, just to show how uh, I took a song along to a rehearsal, and then we put it together as a band and talk through what sort of feel it should have and how the bass part should go, blah, you know that sort of thing. Um, so we did a lot, packed a lot into a short period of time, uh, but I was gobsmacked when I heard the tapes that because they're most desk tapes. A shit house, you know, like they, they're just mostly awful because you know the guitar player will be too loud, so the sound engineer can't put him in the mix, and uh, the the uh, the singer will be right up, right up front in the mix, and the uh, usually you know taking off a desk they sound pretty awful. So, but uh, Dave, the sound guy we had at the time. Whether he he must have used the sub mix or something, I think, because it was really well balanced, yeah. and I was gobsmacked. I went, wow, this is actually quite good. There were a couple of tracks that were dreadful. I, I, I probably uh, had too much to drink on those on a couple of nights. I think um, that I scrapped a couple of tracks, but uh, most of uh, well, except for a couple of tracks, it's, it's what was on the tape. So there's quite a few tracks there, 20, 20, 23 or something like that, tracks. Yeah, you, you play some covers on the album uh, and, and really show your influences at the time. Um, who were the guitarists that you were admiring around that time? Oh, the usual suspects. Uh, Jeff Beck, God bless his soul. Uh, Eric Clapton, um, yeah, the, the Bob Dylans, the, the Mark Knopfler, you know, Dire Straits, um, any, anything that was 
uh, a sort of what I'd call a, a blues, blues to folk to pop sort of area, uh, mainly done by guitar players. <laughs> they were the influencers. And of course, the straight blues guys, you know, the, the Albert Kings, the BB King, Freddie King, all of whom I've done shows with, toured with Freddie King. Um, uh, Roy Buchanan, Roy was a, a big influence. And uh, yeah, so just uh, all that stuff, very much guitar players, but pretty, pretty focused into a blues zone. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Jeff Beck, who sadly passed away recently. And also uh, yesterday we learned that uh, Renee Gaya passed away. Did you uh, work with Renee often? Uh, well, when she, I played on her first solo album. She, the first, first album she did was with a Sydney band called, called Sun. And then she came to Melbourne uh, she actually uh, she actually lived uh, stayed with my first wife and myself when she first got to Melbourne. Uh, Michael bought it. Michael Gudinski bought it down. Uh, so she lived with us for a while, uh, and then I played on her first solo album. Um, and then, of course, BG Barry Sullivan from Chain uh, worked with her uh, on the. Uh, Ready to Deal album, from which uh, Heading in the Right Direction made a first hit for her. Uh, and then um, during the early 80s, I did a few shows with my band backing her, um, which was pretty interesting stuff. Very demanding woman. Um, you know, I, I, I found it really challenging, actually, because I, I, I had to sing harmonies with her. And she's such a she's such a fucking great singer, and uh, and I'm not, <laughs> and uh, I had a bit of a hard time of that, but um, yeah 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 she was she was mighty really you know and she she did a lot a lot and uh, I just it's one of those things that um, I, I mean I haven't spoken to her for a long time now. Uh, but there was no sort of warning in the public that it was coming. Uh, the same as there was no warning with Jeff Beck. Uh, and they're the hard ones, I find. You know, the, you know, like when, when Dutch Tilders died or Lobby Lloyd died, it was expected. You know, and um, it was, oh, finally, you know. Uh, but then, you know, when, Bill, say, Billy Thorpe died, it was like, holy shit, what happened? You know, um, Oh, yeah, we're all getting a bit older. <laughs> yeah. Um, another thing you're doing is uh, you're playing our Melbourne Guitar Show with Nick Charles. Um, how far back did you and, and Nick go? Uh, well, over the years, we've we've done shows together where, you know, he might open for me, uh, uh, but then at the end of the night, we'll do a few songs together. Uh, or you know, alternatively, I might open for him. You know, that, that's those sort of things have happened over the years. Um, but we haven't really formally done much together. You know, like you know, meet up at a folk festival, and you know, he's on the same stage as me, or we do. You know, we've done things at festivals uh, where there's a round robin with a number of people on stage, and you sit next to each other and play a little bit. But but we just did a show, uh, a Christmas show for the Melbourne Blues Appreciation Society, MBAs. And for that, we actually had a Zoom rehearsal and worked to set out and had a mighty time. And um, so we're going to do uh, a show on the Sunday, uh, 11, I think it's going to be 11.30 on Sunday morning uh, at the Melbourne Guitar Show. And that'll be a... Nick and I rehearsed, <laughs> not just jamming, which is wonderful. And a lot, he's a great player, a lot of fun, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then hopefully we'll do some more later in the year. Yeah. Well, what are your memories of uh, previous Melbourne guitar shows? 
you know, they have stages, a number of stages, and they're great. You know, you can go and catch an electric player outside or, or you, can, you know, go upstairs and there's acoustic things happening and it's all spread out. But, but of course, the area where they've got all the gear, uh, you know, every, every second guitar player's trying out an amp or a guitar and half of them are playing uh, Stairway to Heaven and the other half are playing Smoke on the Water or something, and they're all playing them together in different keys. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've been to guitar shows before. You know what they're like. Yeah. Uh, but the actual, you know, it, that's, uh, what's great about it is that there's something for everyone. You know, right from classical music right through to heavy metal uh, or, or hip hop and whatever. Uh, there, there's something for everyone at those shows, which is a mighty thing, really. Yeah. Um, there's so much happening for you, Phil. You're also uh, playing with Chain uh, 55th anniversary uh, shows, uh, playing Blues Fest up at Byron Bay and Blues Fest Melbourne. Um, what are your early memories of working with Peter Noble? Well, working with Peter goes back to the 70s, I think, uh, when he was, uh, you know, just one of the one of the Sydney promoters. That uh, no, but that's how uh, Peter was. Just he was just one of those guys who booked bands and and promoted a bit, and then over the years. Uh, he developed it and grew with it, um, like a lot of a lot of the promoters and 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 agents tend to sort of stick to the one thing and they just move through doing that. A few people, uh, like Gadinsky, Michael Chug, uh, you know, aim for higher things, you know, like or, or you know people like. The, that band that uh, that played on the Arca album with Paul Wheeler, Trevor Courtney, and myself, uh, we did a lot of shows for Zev Isaacs and Michael Koppel um, back there. So there, there's another, and these are all guys who sort of came up to pretty high standards in what they did. Well, Peter's just about upended all of them because uh, the Blues Fest has got to be just about the greatest event that you could possibly hope for. I, I mean, it's uh, I I played at the first. I'm not sure whether I played at the very first. I think I did. But at one stage, I'd played at nine out of 11 Blues Fests. And I've played quite a few since. Um, and I've just seen it grow from... You know, a little little thing in the piggery at Byron Bay to move to the Belongal Fields, and then they went somewhere else for a couple of years, and then uh, they eventually bought the their own area at Tiagra. And uh, I mean, Peter's got a, an unbelievable team that uh, that work on making making it work, and. Uh, so yeah, we're doing that, but we're, Chain are also doing uh, months before. We're doing three Melbourne gigs. We're doing um, we're doing Friday the tenth of March uh, at uh, the Memo in St Kilda. Uh, we're doing the Saturday the eleventh down at Archie's Creek, uh, which is the which is the revised Caravan Club. And then on the Monday afternoon, we're doing Way Out West at Newport. So that's going to keep us busy. So, uh, And then a month after that, we've got the uh, the Blues Fest stuff. And then a week after, uh, oh, that's right, a week after Melbourne. So, yeah, the 16th of March, I'm doing the Fourth Valley Blues Fest. So, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty busy in the early part of the year. Um, and um, yeah. yeah, looking forward to it. Just got to make sure I keep my health together. Yeah, <laughs> and and Blues Fest is coming to Melbourne for two days, uh, and you're playing that. Um, who do you consider the pioneers of the Melbourne blues scene? 
Well, I mean, really, at the end of the day, it's Dutch Tilders, us. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, they're, they're, look, back in the in, back in the sort of mid sixties, there was Dutch Tilders who was died in the wall, folky folk blues, you know, the real deal sort of thing. And then there were bands like the Bay City Union uh, and uh, the, what were they called? The, uh, oh, I've got slipped, their name slips my mind at the moment. Um, a band that uh, uh, Broderick Smith was in, okay. who eventually became Carson. All right, yep. And, uh, and, of course, and of course, there was Lobby Lloyd and the, and, and the Purple Hearts. Then the wild cherries, and uh, and that was that was really the sort of beginning of the real beginning of blues. But uh, as far as sort of on a, a fairly big public level, but at the same time in the sixties, uh, there were a lot of other artists that were playing in what were called rhythm and blues bands. And they were all doing copies of John Lee Hooker and, you know, all, we're all playing stuff from Chicago blues and uh, that sort of thing. So um, it's a bit hard to sort of put your finger on who really started. Chain was definitely the only one at that time to have a, a full hit with a blues record. Um, in fact, not many people have since. But, um, <laughs> Uh, so what's left to do, Phil? Any any bucket list projects? Uh, no, not really. I uh, no, I look. I suppose I, I suppose I'd probably love to go back to Europe. I've never had any much desire to go to America, strangely enough. Uh, but I I did three tours of Ireland, and absolutely loved it. Um, but like I stopped drinking three years ago, so whether I'd have as much fun going back, <laughs> going back then now as I did back then, I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I wouldn't mind going over there. But the 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 international situation has has changed a great deal, and as as we all know. And uh, so I'm pretty happy just staying here. My wife and I like to go to to beaches and have holidays and walk along the sand. And I intend to paint a lot more. And uh, and I've got in mind I I want to do some more recording and more vid and and some uh, live acoustic video stuff, playing 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 old blues songs and playing. Uh, things that I've written in a traditional style. And then apart from that, the main bucket list thing is staying alive. <laughs> <laughs> and keeping healthy. Yeah. Well, Phil, it's been great to catch up again and, and people have got uh, a lot of opportunities to see you and, and Shane this year. And uh, thanks for joining us again. Thank you, Greg. And uh, I look forward to seeing the article. and. And uh, I guess we'll talk soon. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. <laughs>